Ja, herzlich willkommen. Schön, dass ihr wieder da seid. Schaut mal, wo ich bin. Ja, ich bin bei ATC und zwar ist das hier in Stroud. Gute zwei Stunden außerhalb von London. Sehr idyllisch hier, leider bei sehr bescheidenem Wetter. Aber ich bin schon sehr gespannt auf das Ganze. ATC, ja, Traditionsbetrieb, sage ich es mal, Familienbetrieb in zweiter Generation, wie ich erfahren habe. Manufaktur. Das wird bestimmt spannend. Dranbleiben. Hier auf dieser Tafel sieht man mal ein paar Kunden von ATC, darunter natürlich äh, bekannte Studios und auch Tontechniker, äh, Musikingenieure, Produzenten, zum Beispiel Bob Ludwig liest man hier etc. etc. Das ist schon beeindruckend. So my name is Richard Newman and I'm the head of engineering at ATC, so I kind of take charge of um, product development and managing the R&D team. Um, I'm trained as an acoustic engineer, so I've got a lot of experience in transducer design and acoustics. So um, yeah, so well, welcome to ATC, this is our factory, we've been here for quite a number of years, I think since the 80s, something like that at this site. Yeah. So the actual facility that you can see is a, an old military building. Uh, we've been here for many years. In many ways, we've actually outgrown this site. The factories, essentially, there are three different areas that we're going to look at today. There's our cabinet factory, which is in a separate location up in Evesham. You're uh, going to go there tomorrow morning. You'll go there tomorrow morning, that's right, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll come up with you to that. Um, the building here is where we build all our drive units. So everything from 15-inch base drivers all the way down to 25mm tweeters, all built in this factory. Uh, the building here is uh, final test, um, electronics assembly, final assembly. Okay, so this is the uh, drive unit factory here at ATC, it says it on the wall. We've got, um, I don't know, maybe 20 people, something like that, working in this factory, wow. building drive units. Um, actually takes quite a lot of training to, to build the drivers because there's a lot of skill involved in, in, in the process. Everything, um, everything starts live um, at the voice coil stage. And that's one thing that we're really proud of here at ATC is that we really do try and make as much of the loudspeaker as we possibly can. And what I'm about to show you in the voice coil winding room is quite a unique facility, I think, within, probably within British manufacturing and within probably loudspeaker manufacturing as a whole. Um, to, man to flatten your own voice coil and wind your own voice coil is something a, a little unique nowadays. So usually if you have any problems with a loudspeaker, it tends to be related to being overdriven or something like that, which would put high demands on the voice coil. So trying to make a robust voice coil is really quite important. And in fact, ATC's history goes way back into PA. And when Billy started the company and he was making PA drivers, he was very focused on power handling and high dynamic range in the drive units. And really a lot of that is, in, you know, it's a lot of work in the voice coil that, that plays into that. So we'll show you how we do that. You know, all ATC's voice coils are, um, well, the vast majority of them, nearly all of them are short coil, long gap magnet configurations. Now you can create a coil where the coil is much longer than the magnetic gap. So the magnetic gap sits here, the coil is very long, and the coil moves back and forth like this. Or you can create a magnetic gap that's very long and a very short coil that sits inside, or any kind of combination of anything in between those. Now, the interaction of the coil can really, a magnet assembly can generate different types of distortions and in our opinion one of the best approaches, if not the best approach, is to use a short coil long gap design which means that the coil sits immersed inside this iron, inside the magnetic field at all times. What that means is that as the coil moves back and forth, the 
inductance of the coil, so which is a property, electrical property of the coil, doesn't change with displacement. Whereas if you have a coil that's longer than the gap, as it ventures outside of the metal work, the inductance changes. As it ventures inside, the inductance changes. So there are various techniques to get around that, but it overcomplicates somewhat the design. So we always use short coil, long gap designs. So when you've got this coil height or a coil length, which in this case, this is a mid-range dome coil, the coil height, so the distance from the bottom of the coil to the top, is limited in the design. It's designed into it. It needs to be 3.5 millimeters in this case. So what we need to do is get as much copper into that space as we possibly can. We've got 3.5 mil, we've got seven and a half mil gap, I think, five mil gap. And we need to try and get as much copper into that space as possible. So the first thing that we do is we purchase various different grades of copper wire, different gauges. The copper wire looks like it doesn't have an insulator on it, but it does, it has a clear enamel insulator on it. And we take that, cop that round section copper wire and we put it through our wire, wire flattening machine. What this machine does is it takes that round wire and it squashes it down into a, a rectangular shape. I'd like to think it was perfectly rectangular, but it will in fact have some rounded edges on it because of the nature of the, the method. Um, so at this, point, at this point, the wire's been flattened. If you look carefully, when I rotate that, you'll see the light reflects off it differently. Yeah. So the thickness that we flatten it to is really, really critical. If you flatten it down so it's very, very thin, you'll get more turns on that, that 3.5 mil height that we were looking at. So the inductance will change, the, what they call the force factor will change, various other parameters will change, the DC resistance will change. And this machine actually was built by Billy's brother when they first started ATC. So the machines that we look at in this room, particularly the, the, the wire flattening machine, has been around since like the late 70s, I guess, early 80s. And you know, every ATC loudspeaker that has ever been has been through that machine. And that includes, you know, you think about Live Aid, we did a lot of drive units for that, all the drive units that were there, all the records that have been mixed on the speakers. It's, it's done a lot, of, um, a lot of voice coils. We then place it onto the voice coil winding machine. And at this point, this is the, the tricky bit because we flatten this thing into a rectangular shape. And what we want to do now is edge wind it. So not wind it like a ribbon, but wind it on its edge. So if you were to cut a cross section through the voice coil, uh, the voice coil like through here, you just cut a cross section through here. Instead of seeing circles like this, you would see rectangles stacked on top of one another. So we'd have more copper in that space, a higher packing ratio, which is the thing we're trying to achieve. So the real trick now is to try and get that wire and wind it onto these voice coil formers on its, on its side, on its edge. And that's what these machines do. So this is our, our voice coil winding machine. So what we do with this is we load this into here. This is where I've been on camera is an absolute nightmare because I never get this right. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, this is the former material. We're going to reject all this later. This is the thing that's inside the drive unit. In fact, this is a mid-range dome former. It's capped on. So once we, we get the capped on, we actually abrade it. You can see that there's lines down it. We have a little machine outside that scratches up the surface to make sure we get a good adhesion with the coil. We've got a capped on former there. And we've got our winding plate here. So the mandrel sits in there, and this is the, uh, the winding plate. Now, <clears throat> we have winding plates machined specific to each voice coil design. So if you just let me just grab one off the wall, then I'll show you how they work. Again, precision machine components. They have, they have a small little helix in them there. You see a little step there? Uh, they have a groove, sorry, not a helix. They have a groove there that sits perfectly tangential with this, this opening. Now, if I run my, run my finger around there, What's happening is that my finger's getting higher and higher and higher, then it's dropping off there. So there's, a, there's a, 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 a turn in there, a helix. It's going up, it drops down, it goes up, drops down. So when we, when we put all this together, and we've got a mandrel in there, the wire comes into here, we hold it in, in place, and it sits flat in, in there. This sits on top of there like that, grabs the voice coil former just by its edge. That goes on there, the wire comes down here under that little wheel, and we put this, what we call the finger, <laughs> on top of it there. Then, under here, we have some weights. So as you, you drop this down, this comes down, that face becomes in direct contact with that winding plate, and we have the wire sandwiched in between. Um, and then that starts to rotate, and as it's rotating round, we apply some of these thermoset glues that we've got, different designs, in, into this. It's quite a messy job, really, so it's called wet winding. But what happens is you'll end up with that popping out of the top, like this. 
and the coil will be wound on, 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 onto the mandrel. So yeah, so we wind our coils there, like this. We end up with them on the shelf here. And at this point, they need some further work and they need dressing up. There's lots of adhesive on them. They're not baked yet. And um, we need to make them, get them into a form that they're suitable for building into the drive unit. Yeah. We've wound our coils in there. As I said earlier, they're overwound in both directions. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna pull back the turns on the top and bottom of that voice coil, make it nice and neat and tidy. So we pull back the turns on the bottom to make a one millimeter gap down there. That's called the, uh, the former tail. And then we have some gauges somewhere in here. Some gauges in here that we use for setting the, um, the voice coil heights. So, so the guys in here will pull back the turns until they get this gauge to fit in there and be, be spot on. And then they will, um, we then glue, glue the edge of the turn on there. And then we start to laminate up these voice coil formers because at present they're not actually suitable for use just like that. They need to be, this needs a bit more structural integrity. We checked it. Oh, yeah, I think at that point we can check it. So we can pull back the number of turns. We can pull the insulator off. Oh, sorry, remove the insulator and check the DC resistance. And again, if we've wound it on the right mandrel and we've flattened it correctly and it was the right gauge wire to start off with and the wire tensioner wasn't too high and we didn't put too much weight on the wind, winding machine. Which never happens because the, the girl in there's a pro. <laughs> yeah, Kate is, Kate is the winder, she's a pro. <laughs> So at that point we'd read this and it'd have a DC resistance that would fit within an acceptable window that we've set. Um, so then we start to laminate up the former. So and that's what Kate is doing now. So, so we're actually taking the same adhesive that we use on the voice coil in this instance. And, and what Kate is doing here is putting uh, a Nomex layer around the aluminium uh, voice coil former. So that'll act as a, um, a thermal insulator for the paper which will go on afterwards. So we've, we've got, on this particular design, we have a, a Nomex layer, and then Kate is gonna put on a craft paper layer on that, and we do multiple, multiple layers. So in the end, th th these, these layers that we're putting on there will, and it will, will give the thing some structural integrity, and they'll also add some kind of, some mechanical, some kind of damping properties in there, so which is also a benefit. How, how many of these layers? In but this case, it's just three. Okay. Uh, two, two papers, one, one Nomex. Okay. So what we do then is we wrap elastic bands around that entire assembly. So at this point, inside there, there's lots of uh, thermoset adhesive that's not being cured. We need to bake it in the oven. So we put the elastic bands around there. It keeps everything in its place. And then when it goes through the thermocycle in the oven, any, it prevents or restricts any uh, off-gassing and any kind of bubbles forming inside those laminations. We've got some coils More in there. Than 60 degrees. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to keep them for too long. <laughs> so they come out and then they go on the shelf here. And at this point, we've now got different designs, different, uh, different voice coils just sat here waiting to go to the next stage of assembly. So, I mean, that's a, 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 again a mid range dome. You can see actually that the process, while, you know, while we've been doing it many years the same way, actually results in a really, really beautiful coil. You can't actually even see the turns no. in there. You have to get. It looks like look, one. It looks, looks like one solid look, piece. Yeah, yeah. it really is. Yeah. yeah. One important thing to 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 highlight actually is that whether we're making an SCM7 or an SCM300, they all go through exactly the same process. So the SCM7, we have to spend as long doing the coil as we do on an SCM300. Yeah. Okay. It's the same same thing. We don't we don't change the approach. So this would be a. SCM11, that would be the mid-range dome. This would be a 15-inch SL used on the, on the mm -hmm. SCM150. So, a little machine here for cutting the form to the right length. Another bespoke machine here that we made for um, abrading the top of the formers, as we discussed. So really, in, in this factory, we've got kind of three, three lines, if you like. The line at the back over there is really uh, base drivers. So when you think of a three-way speaker system, it's the paper cone, carbon fiber paper cone that we would use in the three-way system. Limited bandwidth, you know, 20 hertz to 380 hertz is the operating band for, for each one of those drivers. The bench down the middle here and around here, this is all base mid drivers or mid base drivers that are used in our two-way speakers. So here's an SCM7 base driver. And here are the, the software components for an SCM7 coming together. And this is a, a CLD drive unit. So all we can do now is we can look at the next stage. We've got our voice coil. 
which we've made in the other place. We've still got it on the man. We've still got it on the mandrel. We're going to keep it on that for as long as possible because they're actually very fragile. And as soon as you take it off that, they could they could be damaged. So we've got a spider, typical spider that you would find, roll surround, and a fabric diaphragm with a number of different hand coated layers of damping on them. So one common trait that you see in ATC drive units is that we you won't see any aluminium or kind of really stiff, lightweight diaphragm structures. We tend to always use really heavily damped um, uh, diaphragms and cones where we can. Come this way. So St Steve's um, build a mid-range dome here. Yeah? Let me tell you a little bit more about this drive unit, if I can get somewhere where you can all see me. Can I get around there? Let me get over there. OK, excuse me. So the, the mid-range dome, again, you know, it's the same principle that we see on the other drive units, really. We've got our suspension, which is like the spider or the roll surround. The mid-range dome also has one on the bottom, so it has two. It's what we call a dual suspension design, like our 25mm tweeter. The former is held both at the top and it's held at a point halfway down. Now, this is all built by hand, as you can see behind you. Steve's building, building some mid-range domes. Um, it's a multi-part assembly that we assemble, you know, piece by piece, and then we hand coat the, um, the diaphragms with these, these polymers. These are the, um, the, the, ter the terminal wires, you can see they go to the terminal. They run back down the voice coil, here on the back, and to a point you can't see on the other side. There's a little bracing ring in there that helps keep the thing nice and round under, under high, high dynamic loads. So when you get to the magnet assembly stage, this is a magnet for mm -hmm. it, there's a, a feature on it around here. Uh -huh. This locates on there, fits onto that feature, and won't move anywhere. Ah, clever. Yeah? yeah. So, and it, it goes on there really tightly. That's not actually on there properly. It's just sat resting on top. We then fix it down with these bolts. It's uh, manufactured out of Swedish iron. After it's been machined, we send it off to be magnetically annealed to get the best magnetic performance from it. The mid-range dome has, you know, it's got a backplate pole, magnet, front plate, um, uh, back plate, sorry, a pole, front plate, and a magnet. At this point, that's not magnetized. We assemble it unmagnetized. Mm -hmm. We put it into the yeah. magnetizer. This is a magnetizer here. Yeah, this, this is like, so this is the old boy that we've had forever uh -huh. that Billy bought second hand. Wow, this and is historic. It, this is it's still, yeah, it still works. In fact, the company, Hearst, Hearst Magnetics, are still around, they're a UK company. And they came up a few years ago, and the guy didn't even recognize it. It's like yeah. well before <laughs> they can, they've got no records of it, but it still works. Right. Yeah. But that's the old one. We've got newer ones too. So the, this one here is, there's two coils in here. Yeah. They are connected to that wardrobe looking thing at the back there, you can see the beige thing. That's the, that's the new magnetizer, which is much more powerful. Yeah. Mid-range domes, base mid or mid-base drivers, or our base drivers. Uh, we then need to put our chassis onto our magnet assembly, which we're doing here. Mm -hmm. This is a perfect, uh, lovely illustration of our SL rings that we, we talk about. Are there differences between the home stuff and the pro stuff no. here? So that, that that drive unit could go in an SCM25, uh -huh. or it could go in an SCM40. Wow. SCM25A Pro or an SCM40. Mm -hmm. You know, that base driver could go in an SCM20 ASL Pro or an SCM20 Hi-Fi. It's the same same drivers. So this is um, this is where we build tweeters. Yeah, after 40, after 40. So back in in 2014, we started manufacturing our own our own tweeters. Uh, one thing that we wanted to do with the tweeter was tr try and make a mini mid-range dome to the best of our ability. Um, so to do that, what we decided to do was to try and do a dual suspension tweeter. If you look at a 25 millimeter tweeter, they generally look like this. This looks pretty standard, really. It's, you know, from that angle, it's nothing exceptional. But what you would find if you looked under the hood of most 25 mil tweeters is that this voice coil former would be probably about half the height of that. 
be a lot, uh, yeah, a lot smaller, mm -hmm. and the there wouldn't be this second component here, this second suspension. You would just be looking at the back side of this. So if you imagine a boy skull form stood up like that with a roll surround coming off it and the dome, and then that that as, as an assembly is not very stable. If you were to get that and push on one side of it, it would tilt over because it's only held by one point at the top. Mm -hmm. So what they tend to do is put, the, put that inside a magnetic gap and put um, oil inside the magnetic gap, ferrofluid, which keeps it stable and helps with cooling and various other things. Um, but Billy was pretty much against ferrofluid. So we don't use ferrofluid, but what we do do is extend the length of that former and we use a second suspension on the bottom, mm -hmm. which means that this assembly is inherently stable. So if you push one side, the entire thing bobs up and down. So it's a very, very stable, mechanical stable structure. And I'm not sure if there, maybe somebody else has done it, but I'm not aware of any other 25 mil dual suspension tweeters in the marketplace. So we make two versions, one which goes in our entry series and one which goes in our um, higher end speakers, but they're all essentially the same, both dual suspension built on this. The um, higher performing part uses a larger piece of neodymium in the magnet assembly. So one downside of having this larger form is more mass to move. And if you want to control that mass, and keep the top end extension high, you need to really, really saturate the magnetic gap to get as much energy into, around the coil as you possibly can. So we use this oversized piece of high grade neodymium with a highly optimized magnet assembly and a very tight magnetic gap to get the magnetic field incident on the coil very, very high. And that means that the third harmonic distortion is pretty much non-existent because that's tied to, the, to that, that, that flux density. And it means that the overall extension and sensitivity of the part is, is where it needs to be. So we have several, we have probably five different Clipple QC systems in the factory. In here we have one down there driven by one of our P2 power amplifiers. Inside here we have a, a box that's, that's dead. Acoustically it's got some foam inside it. We have a microphone facing up that sits pointing here, half a metre away from there. Mm -hmm. That is the back side of one of our waveguides that you see on the front of the speaker. So you can match it by uh, 0 0.5 yeah. pieces? Yeah, so we, we, we lock it in there. Obviously, there's a magnet assembly on the back there. Lock yeah. it in, and we do a sweep with the clipple system. And what it'll do is it'll check frequency response. We, d we define, Cal and I will define the limits on, on what, what's acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, it'll also measure the distortion. It'll do a really high level um, power sweep as well to check that the thing's not going to fall apart in the field and that it's got the right properties. And it does that in there when it's quiet, otherwise it'd be deafening. Okay, so what we've got in here is um, a little test booth for checking, checking base drivers and mid-range domes. So just like with the tweeters, the mid-range domes are a closed back system. They're not operating in, in free air and they're very, very loud. And we want to test them at very high sound pressure levels to make sure they perform well at those, at those high drive levels. So we have a larger version of the box we have in that room. We build our mid-range domes, we put them in here, we lock them in with a big clamp, and we have the clip-all system again. We define the limits, the guys in production run it, runs a sweep and tells them whether it's a pass or fail. Uh, how many hours did you burn, uh, a customer should burn, burn in a mid-range? Well, 300 I, hours, 500 no, hours, I mean, after what time do you think is a... Is a well, I think it's, the entire idea of burning is an interesting topic, and I think that you know our position on it really is that when you'll see in a minute the way we're going to test this base driver that I think it sees most of its burning at this point or at least a massive amount of burning. Now if you think about what burning actually is, really, it, it's really probably about the loosening up or the kind of breaking down of the fibres in some of the suspension components. The coil's not going to change, the diaphragm shouldn't change. The only thing that really gets mechanical stress and we'll see some potential change in the long term albeit I will caveat that by saying that the materials are chosen to be as stable as possible long term, is the suspension component. So when we test the drivers, the base drivers in the factory, they get, a, they get abused at this point, essentially. Um, and really, they shouldn't need burning in after that. There should be very little. And the mid-range domes are the same. It doesn't really move at all, so it shouldn't really change. It should be very stable. So this is a 15-inch SL base driver. Um, it's got our superlinear magnet assembly on it. Um, you'd find this inside an SCM 150 or an SCM a pair of them in SCM 300. Uh, we're a very simple test setup. We're not really at this point that interested in how this is going to perform 
um, from a frequency response perspective because we'll measure that later. What we're interested in, has it been built properly? You can't, so you can't, it won't damage your ears because the base driver at this, in this setup is operating in free air. There's no cabinet behind it. As it pushes air in that direction, it pulls it from that direction. So there's very, very low pressure change. So it doesn't, you can't really hear anything other than the defects. So let's have a go. So we have voltage here. That's a voltage across those two terminals. We have a frequency there, so that's 20k all the way down to 10 hertz. And the best thing about this system is that you can just, with one rotation of your wrist, you can do the entire, um, free, entire audible frequency range, which is quite, quite difficult to find. Um, yeah. uh, you know, signal generators that do that. Mm. So these guys that do it. We, we've got some old BNK systems that we used to use, but they've gone a bit unreliable now, sadly. So at this point, yeah, we're at 20k. Just turn up a little bit. So, so that's what, oops, that's 20 hertz, uh, 20 volts. So that is, is really, you know, if that was inside an SCM 150, that would be like really, really loud. <laughs> but because it's pulling and pushing at the same time, you know, because your ear's not particularly sensitive at 20 hertz, yeah. you can't really hear anything. But what you would hear, if there was any defects, you would hear them now, you'd hear it, because they'd sound, it'd, it'd probably sound a bit strange. So, yeah. Right, we're going to go this way. Green. All right. So, as an illustration of how much we've run out of space, this um, this is here to keep things in the daytime. Um, but if you come with me, what we're going to do now is we've, we're going to say we've done drive units. We'll visit loudspeakers in a minute when we get to that point. But I'm going to show you some electronics. Yeah, you know, when everybody thinks of ATC, they think first and foremost of loudspeakers, which is absolutely fair. We're called Acoustic Transducer Company, Loudspeaker Technology Limited. It makes absolute sense. But as a company, we've been making electronics, designing and building electronics um, since the first Active Amp Pack, which was in the 80s. We've done standalone electronics since the mid 90s. It's a big part of our business, particularly active um, amplifier modules. You know, we make a lot of them. We probably employ as many people making electronics as we do making drive units and loudspeakers. A big, big part of the business. It's important to kind of get that across. You know, going forward, we're going to be adopting a, a little more surface mount technology. And that's what we've got in here. It's the new surface mount line that we're getting up and running. Um, so there's a couple of things in this room. We've got a little 3D printer at the end that we use for prototyping. You guys saw some, something that came off that earlier. We use the printer also for um, making bits of tooling for the factory. It's very handy for knocking things up quickly. Uh, making chassis, making all sorts of things. So for those of you that aren't familiar with manufacturing electronics, it tends to be two different, well, there are two different basic types of components. You've got your through hole components, which are components that sit on a PCB, go through the PCB and are soldered into it. And then you have surface mount components, which are components that sit on the surface of the component, sorry, surface of the PCB. But we already use a mix of surface mount and through hole at ATC. Um, our CDA2 is all is, is a big mix. The SA200, the CD2, the SCM20, um, various products use quite a lot of surface mounts. So we're trying to do more, more of it here. Um, and what we've got here is a, a line for that, a surface mount line. So, and what we've got here is a typical um, surface mount PCB. All the components are on the top, nothing really on the bottom. This machine is going to pick up those components and place them down on top of all those little pads in the right order, the right components in the right place. The first thing that you do is you need to paste onto this PCB the solder. So we have screens like this that we put inside a screen printer. That lines up, which I'll never be able to do on the fly, but that lines up over there, over the pads. It shows you all the pads. You put the paste on, remove that. Then you end up with this PCB with all the, the wet solder all over it. Inside each one of these, we have different value components. The machine's programmed to understand and know what it's got inside each one of these lanes. So I'll show you it going. Now, I don't want to, I'm not going to throw away some components, so we'll just get it doing a dry, a dry run. Um, so if you, if you look down there, you can actually see its nozzles coming down and, and placing. You can see it kind of picking up the components and then placing them. Yeah. 
So there's, there's five different eating zones in here, and you program, program the machine up accordingly. What happens is, as the board goes through it, it there's a heating profile that's required. If you, if you heat it up too quickly, certain things can happen, like the components can, can deform, or the board can deform, or they can stand up and do various things. So um, it runs through this, this cycle in here, comes out the other end, and then the board's populated. At that point, you need to inspect it. So we have a little inspection microscope. You can use this to kind of, you know, Whoa. Zoom right in and check that you've got a good quality solder joint. Do you, would you come, come with me first, guys? Come this way. We get back to here. So we'll just we'll just continue on shortly on our um, electronics journey. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Floor. Yeah, second floor. So we, um, uh, you know, as I said earlier, space is a problem for us. We, have, we, have, we don't have enough space, so we had to build an entire mezzanine to get more people in. We have folks up here um, populating PCBs mainly. So, you know, our SCM50, SCM100, SCM150 amp pack, that's the PCB for that product. At the moment it's all through whole components here. So the guys would load it onto the bench like this. You know, get the components on the, on the board, flip the board over, and then hand solder. Oh, hand solder? Hand solder everything, wow. yeah. So why you don't do this with a machine like... Because the machine's new. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so at some point, you know, in fact, we, we've been working on a version of this that's surface mount. Yeah. yeah. Um, but for now. But for now, for now, this is the, the, what we call the amp pack. And, and the amp pack really is a kind of bread and butter electronics product for us. We make a lot of them. Um, because they are utilised across a number of different products, which, which is a nice thing to have from a manufacturing perspective. So yes, up here we've got guys populating amplifier boards. We've got people doing um, crossovers. So of course we make passive crossovers as well. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about passive and active. You know, ATC aren't um, against passive. We make a lot of passive products, um, but we're an engineering-based company, and we're a bunch of engineers making products. And when you want to make the best performing products, then the active implementation tends to deliver, or not tends to, but can, has, the potential, has greater potential to deliver a better performing product. It's just the reality of it. Passive crossovers look like this. This is a, a, a large crossover that's going to go in an SCM50, 100 or 150. You know, it's a second order three-way filter, this, so it's um, 12 dB per octave at 380 hertz and 3.5 kilohertz, which are our chosen crossover points in a three-way system. It doesn't change between any speaker that we make, it's always the same same crossover point. Um, the components, as you can see, are very large. In fact, the large ones aren't even placed yet. You know, the, the capacitors are big caps like this. The inductors are almost the size of a Coca-Cola can. There's three of them on here. It's a lot of copper. So, you know, passive crossovers are fab. They do the job. They work well, uh, you know. Now, the wonderful thing when you do an active design, spe specifically from a designer's perspective, is that you have independent control over level and phase. And they're normally on a pot. So all you've got to do is kind of make sure you get filter turnover frequencies correct, populate your board, and then just turn up the mid, turn up the HF, get as flat a frequency response as you like, and then adjust the phase relationship at the crossover points till it's absolutely perfect. With a passive crossover, you're just not afforded that opportunity. You can change the filter shapes and get the level where you want it to be and just really hope that the, the phase response is where you need it to be. You, you, you have to kind of play a trade-off, you don't have independent, discrete control over those parameters, whereas an active design you absolutely do. So I could, there's all sorts of other benefits with active and passive. I'm not going to slate passive because like I say it works well. We do, we do it very well, do it as well as anybody else does. It's just if we're given the choice we prefer active from a performance perspective. So this is a, an amp pack PCB built up, assembled, almost, almost ready to go. The wonderful thing about this design is, is that it's got the MOSFETs mounted on the back face. So they go onto the back panel, the heat sink on the outside of the product. It's really a nice way to do things. Um, we build this up here and then we have a, a, a audio precision test system at the back here, a dummy chassis. We load each, each amplifier onto that chassis and we'll run a test sequence and make sure it's set up appropriately. So we set the bias on the, on the transistors and we'll set the um, common mode rejection and we'll set various other things, make sure everything's working as it should. Okay, so, so we have people populating PCBs upstairs. The PCBs get tested upstairs. By the time they come down here, we know that they are good to go in product. So down here, we have people plating up. And plating up means building up the amplifiers into their chassis and their assemblies. So 
a lot of the products that we make are active amplifier modules, so the guys are more likely to be doing those at present. But we also do make standalone power amplifiers and preamplifiers on the same line, it's all done here. Um, so you'll find products in various different stages of build. What we've got here are some um, C4 sub amplifiers. C4 sub, that's a new sub. Yep. That's right, yeah. So this is also used in a pro sub called, called SCS, SCS 70. So the way, the way this works is you know, you've got your filter board here, your power amplifier module here, and your mains um, board here, and the large toroidal power supply here. It's another class AB design, it's more or less biased mostly in B, to be honest with you, because of those frequencies, it doesn't make any difference at all to the performance, and you get a better uh, bang for your buck. Um, the amplifier module is exactly the same that we find in all our other amplifiers. It's a class AB topology, MOSFET-based power amplifier. Same design that we find everywhere else. Works really well. Problem, we probably get the best performance out of those MOSFETs that, that you can. So at this point, we've plated up the amplifiers. We've made the, the power amplifier or the preamplifier or whatever we're making. They get onto the bench at the end, and it's here where the guys do some final QC and setup on each one of those products. Now, if it's a power amplifier like a P2, it's a case of checking that it meets the right performance criteria, checking that it does everything it's meant to do, uh, and then putting a lid on it and, and getting it ready to go out. If it's an amplifier uh, for one of our active modules, it's an opportunity at this point to set it up specific for an order or for a, a particular speaker. So one of the wonderful things about the amp pack, which is this one, which you find in our SCM50, 100 and 150, yeah. is that we can use it across those three models. We're very consistent in our uh, design and engineering approach. We always put the crossovers at 380 hertz and 3.5 kilohertz. So that means that you can use the same amplifier for those products. Now, what you wouldn't expect, unless you, you're into this, is that when you go from SM50 to an SM100, that 12-inch bass driver is 3 dB more efficient than the 9-inch. It's actually, you get a higher sound pressure level out for a given voltage across its terminals. Oh, okay. It's more efficient. It's more efficient. And then you go to a 15, and it's even more efficient. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the 15 inch is easier to run than the 9 inch. Yeah, what is the mid here? So the, yeah, inside the, the potentiometers, that's the mid phase, mm -hmm. and that's the LF phase. That's the, the crossover points. There are all pass filters at the crossover points, mm -hmm. which don't adjust the level, but adjust the phase only. You can, you can adjust them to get it absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. And then there are mid-level and HF level somewhere down there for adjusting the, the, the speaker. So once we've built the amplifiers and checked they're all working fine, we then need to leave them on soak. So we put a signal through them and we'll leave them running for 20, 48 hours, I think, to check that they don't, you don't see any what they call mo uh, infant mortalities, which are <laughs> components that fail at early doors. So we check them and then we check them again. And then they double go on, check, the, double check, and then they go on the shelf ready to go into speakers. And so it's at this point now where we've, we've built our drive units in the other factory. We've built our electronics in here. All, again, all hand built, all done by the, the guys here at Stroud. And then our cabinet factory, which you'll see tomorrow, have delivered the cabinets to us. Mm -hmm. They all come in the door and the chaps in here assemble the products and do a final test on them before they go out in, in their packaging. So the, the wonderful thing about the design that, that Billy came up with, which is great, is this kind of modularity that we've got. You know, this SEM50, the SEM50 Pro, the SEM50 Tower, the SEM50 Classic, it's the same thing really. They've got the same drivers in, same volume cabinet, same amplifier on the back. You can take the amplifier out of there and put in there a passive crossover, and it, it's exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. So once we've, um, once we've assembled the speaker, and we've put in the electronics, oh, in fact, we have the electronics hanging out the back, and we've put the passive crossover in there. We get the speaker on the bench, we'll lift it up, elevate it away from the floor. This room's quite large. We get the microphone relatively close to the speaker, and we have a, another Clipple QC system where we'll run a frequency sweep through the speaker, make sure that it meets the right criteria and it's got a nice flat frequency response. So every speaker who leaves the building is measured? Every single speaker, yeah. from an SCM7 to you know, whatever we make, right. every single one gets yeah. measured on the, on the clipple and every single one gets a power sweep too where we run a really high voltage through it, even now at this later stage, to check for any air leaks or any other problems that could occur in the drive unit. Yeah. And we do all that in here before we pack them, inspect yeah. them, polish them, pack them.
Oh. All right, folks. Hey. Come on in. Hey. Machining area, obviously. All parts are numerically machined, CNC. For accuracy, for consistency, uh, ma mainly for accuracy, but for, for, for speed and um, prevent human error. It's our, it's our biggest problem. Um, two lines, obviously, pro, hi fi. All, all the parts are machined in a similar process. We're creating parts, stacking the parts, um, then moving through the next process. And it either goes hi-fi, we go to veneering, pro, we'll go straight to assembly. So this area, a bit of storage. Um, you see the main ingredient, the speakers, MDF. We um, we use a, a very, very um, expensive, a very uh, superior uh, quality of MDF because of the machining that we do. And to get the best uh, profile uh, and the best finish, we use moisture resistant board. We don't really think of it because it's moisture resistant, it's because of the density. One of the problems with MDF or a, a negative for MDF is this is its most dense uh, area, and this is its most dense. This is equal, and as you get through it, it becomes less, 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 less. So when we're machining, uh, if you think of uh, cutting the grass, if, if, you're, if, you're, if your grass is floppy, um, as you cut it, it just pushes over but then it stands back up again. And this is what happens with the fibers. So as we machine, especially this, when we finish machining, the fibers stand back up again. And it, 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 it's very rough. So we have to spend a lot of time sanding, abrading this, in order to get this to be like this. In this, all the money goes in this area and this area because it's done by hand. This we machine, easy, this is done by hand. So the last couple of years we've been in investing to try and save time. So they, they built this, this, there is only this machine in the world. They built this for me. It's a very strange, uh, it's, it's their technology, um, the, the abrasive. The abrasive. So it's a, uh, <laughs> I don't know how they came up with it, but this, these abrasive strips, brush, felt, um, which, which spin. And if you look in this side, there are um, some heads which are angled, which we use for the radius. And the machine is very trick. We just press the button, but it, it comes, it looks, it dis <laughs> Uh, we have to give it a few parameters, obviously, but it decides where the edge of the baffle is. It, it starts sanding one way, then it goes, oh, I can't go, I can't go anymore because I'm going to damage it. It then spins the other way, it comes to the end, it does the same. It is, it's, it's, and it, I can sand the baffle here now in maybe one minute. This is European walnut. Very, very beautiful. Thank you. 
Lost it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Ah. You see the difference? Um, yeah. Okay. We have to sell it and get the European. <laughs> Europe. Yeah. It's um, you, you, European walnut is just so much. There's just so much more going on. Um, it, it's a much slower growing tree. Uh, the American walnut is fond okay. in, in te yeah. in, intensely. So it, it's um, quite bland. Um, they they don't. The, the trees, because they're farmed and they're Americans, um, the trees aren't left to mature. You know, they're, they're just yeah. cut at a, 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 a relatively sh short age. So, they, um, so the European one is much expensive. You know, the, the differential between the veneer is not, it's not huge in, yeah. in the scheme of everything else that, you know, the amplifier, you know, all that that, that goes in. You know. This is, this is the same company. This is the same company. Nibbing. It's 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 part of the polish process. So primer, base coat through this machine, and it flattens it and makes it like glass, okay. but, but flattens very very accurately. Um, so it doesn't go through the lacquer. It just creates a, an incredibly flat surface ready for the top coat and cleans. Okay. So before the last coat, finishing coat, this machine. Is yes. Involved. Yes. Yes. Which again, before this machine was done by hand. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's uh, again it's it's all about speed and consistency. Yeah. Um, finishing. Clear lacquer on our veneered speakers. Yeah. Uh, we use an acid catalyzed cellulose based lacquer. Have done forever. There's nothing wrong with it. It ain't broke. There is a lot of push towards using water-based lacquers. Due to whatever environmental reasons, or what is it? Greta. Okay. Um, yes, but like a lot of things, it's not. Is an electric car more environmental than a ten-year-old diesel? No. We don't, um, we don't. We don't know exactly. Um, so the, 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 the problem with the water-based product is, uh, in its infancy, it was, it was a, a terrible product. We just couldn't get the finish. Um, it's getting better and it's getting better and getting better. But, but there are a lot of issues with it. And I, I personally don't get. But you only use that from now? I don't use it. I don't use it at all. No. But there will, I, there will come a time, I am sure, because of its green credentials. OK. so. Although this is warm, it's nothing to do with the heat. This, this is um, infrared. So, so the two plates on the side, here and here, these are they're, they're cat catalytic, yeah. catalytic plates, yeah. cr creating infrared. So they they have a they have a little bit of gas pilot. Okay. They on, on startup they heat up to 400 degrees, okay. and then they maintain that with. Very, very little gas. The, the consumption is minimal. Und was wir hier sehen, das ist dann der Hörraum von ATC und da haben wir natürlich auch einiges an Musik gehört. Ich muss sagen, diese ganze Tour äh, war absolut beeindruckend wieder für mich. Ähm, ich habe mir das wieder alles viel mehr vorgestellt als äh, so Masse und vom Band. Das ist mal hier wieder überhaupt nicht so. Das äh, wirkt sehr familiär alles und freundschaftlich, auch die Mitarbeiter da irgendwie untereinander. Und und sowas dann mal äh, wieder zu sehen, wie sowas wirklich entsteht und was da alles dahinter steckt, 
ähm, ist für mich ja immer so ein Augenöffner irgendwie, weil ich mir das immer alles viel größer und schneller vorstelle. Aber umso cooler und sympathischer finde ich, dass es nicht so ist, sondern äh, genau so ein Handwerk und ja im verhältnismäßig Kleinen noch entsteht. Und ähm, das ist macht für mich ATC als Lautsprecherhersteller noch mal irgendwie mehr besonders. Also fand ich ganz toll. Ansonsten würde ich sagen, schaut gerne noch ein altes Video von mir. Vielen Dank fürs Zuschauen und bis zum nächsten Video. Bis dann, dann.